I'm Rex Hamilton. Uh, our family operates here in Texas County, Missouri in the Ozark Highlands. Things change so slow in our life that we don't really, we, we, we get to thinking, well, things are, what we see now is the way it's always been. But uh, it, it's pretty obvious that things have changed. I mean, you, you, just nature alone changes things with droughts, floods, fires, hard winters, different things. And then you throw in Native Americans for a few thousand years and Europeans for a couple hundred, and uh, you've got big changes we've made on the landscape and in, in nature. From our perspective and studies, uh, when the settlers came, we, we tend to think this was a pristine wilderness, but even then it had been managed by Native Americans for thousands of years using fire and other means. And uh, also the stories from the old, the old people that took us, that go clear back to settlement, uh, that it was a open, open savanna situation, a huge portion of it with scattered trees, more park-like with native grass, wildflowers growing in between. You would have had on the better slopes, north and east slopes where the soils are deeper, you would have more density of trees and also maybe to some degree along the riparian areas along the stream. We, we've got a sample here of uh, how it would have would have looked like with the scattered trees. And, and this tree behind us is uh, a tree that I actually cleared this land with a bulldozer in 1972. This is one of the big trees that was there then. Uh, we're we're going to estimate that it's at least 200 years old. And it's a good example of uh, how the trees grew in a more scattered situation. You'll notice they, the trees have big, big uh, crowns, wide, maybe as much as 50 feet wide, the drip line on these trees. And, <clears throat> and those are trees that grew without having to compete with another tree real close uh, for sunlight, because the whole system runs off solar. And uh, so they, they grew without that. And at the time we cleared this in 1972, they were the big trees uh, that were, but it had through overgrazing and everything through the years it, and mismanagement, it had filled in with woodies so you could hardly, hardly walk through the vegetation without stooping and changing course. To draw a picture of the best we know what was here before settlement, of course we have my family history going back and the other, the other settlers when they came. We also have written accounts at that time of one, one traveler being uh, Henry Rose Schoolcraft that came through this area in 1818, 1819. And he was by far not the first traveler through the Ozarks, but he was one that kept detailed accounts of a diary daily. And so he came through just a few miles north of here and he points out big areas of grassland that they traveled through once they got up out of the repairing areas. As an example of the savanna we had here originally, when the area was ready for settlement, the government land office, GLO, came through and established ever, ever square mile, they would establish a corner. We're standing on one now in the middle of the county road and it's uh, not visible, it's buried, but protected from vehicles. What they do is they establish the exact point and then they will establish witness trees, usually three to four, uh, in different directions, different degrees, different distances away from the deal. So they, even if the special point, the corner is destroyed, they can reestablish it. And that's what's happened here more than once. But uh, in the next valley over, we, we operate a farm and it's in the Elk Creek Valley, which lays a little better, a little more flat, was a little more open at uh, settlement than where we're at here. When the GLO or the government land office come through establishing corners there, 
and they keep notes. So in the early 1800s, around 1818 in there, they had trouble getting enough witness trees when they would establish a corner. And they said sometimes they went as much as a thousand lengths, which is basically 600 feet to find a witness tree. To give you an idea, that's the long distance of two football fields. At this site, we have one witness tree uh, visible from here. It'll be about uh, 80 feet to, to the witness tree, and it's got a yellow sign on it that tells you it's to not be destroyed. In this case, we have this witness tree available. Uh, it's about 80 feet away, and uh, I'll walk to it and point it out, and then uh, we will go ahead and walk about 600 feet away, which gives you an idea how far it was to a witness tree in the next valley over when the GLO survey came through. This is the witness tree here. Another account of uh, the, the prairie and their, how extensive it was is by Henry O. Schoolcraft who there again traveled through and he after he left here he traveled on to the Springfield area he went to Smallland Cave by Ozarks and then they crossed the James River into the Kickapoo Prairie and I like to read the insert there the prairies which commence at the distance of a mile west of the river or the James River are the most extensive rich and beautiful of any which I have ever seen west of the Mississippi River they are covered by a coarse wild grass, which obtains so great a height that it completely hides a man on horseback riding through it. We harvest seed on a bunch of these remnant prairies in western Missouri yet, such as he described around Kickapoo Prairie. The, uh, and they are very, very sustainable in that you have maybe three to four hundred different species of plants growing on them so you have all kind of uh, all depth and types of root systems going deep going shallow so we actually have experience on one prairie that has been hayed 95 out of the last 110 years and never been fertilized and it still is is still capable of producing a hay crop each year as farmers well, no, when you're removing hay with our modern systems, uh, you, you end up having to apply huge amounts of fertilizer to keep our modern systems going, which the, the prairies do not require that, even though we hurt them with mismanagement. Um, and, but they are sustainable, so there's no doubt they've been here through the eons. Just a footnote on these prairies, they are known for increasing the, the soil carbon, the organic matter in the soils. And as you look at uh, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, northern Missouri, where we had the tall grass prairie, that was, those soils are formed by tall grass prairie. Another footnote on Schoolcraft, when he traveled through this area, he did mention there was nights uh, they had trouble finding firewood or they had to travel um, extra distance to find firewood for the night. Some of our personal experiences from working on the remnant prairies of both the Ozarks and western Missouri are how, how versatile they are, how sustainable they are, how the, even in drought years there, there's plants that, that does well that you may not see bloom for the last five years, but we have a dry year, here they come. They're, they're the ones that excel that year. The same being for wet years, different management, different whether it's burnt, whether it's not. And, and so they're versatile to the extent that uh, they have sustained this system through the year being, and that this being not only the herbaceous plants, but also the the insects, uh, the invertebrates that are there. And we have certain insects, certain invertebrates 
that totally depend on this prairie ecosystem. When it's gone, they're gone. And vice versa, there's plants on the prairie that depend on a certain insect or to pollinate it. This video is part of a series on what the land was like before European settlement in Missouri. Watch our other videos on streams, glades, wildlife, and Native Americans in pre-settlement times. And even if you're not from Missouri, we hope these videos can help you learn how to read the history of your own landscape.